This is the first part of my talk in which I'll explain how deconvolution can be applied to analysis of the Renogram. I have three aims of this talk. Uh, first, to explain the method of deconvolution as it is applied to the Renogram. Secondly, to describe how it can be used to calculate mean transit time of tracer from the Renogram and also carry out blood background subtraction. And thirdly, to discuss its application in the diagnosis of pelvic junction obstruction. In part one, I'll give an introduction and remind you what a renogram is and talk about kidney transit time. In part two, I'll discuss the theory of deconvolution, uh, explain how it can be thought of as an idealized bolus injection renogram leading to something that we call the impulse response function. I'll give a graphical illustration of convolution and deconvolution and talk about how we calculate mean transit time and subtract blood background. Then in part three, I'll talk about deconvolution in practice, I'll talk about the diagnosis of pelvic urotech junction obstruction, give some examples, uh, discuss the practical considerations and talk about the benefits and limitations of the method. So first of all, let me remind you what a renogram is. The renogram is a diagnostic nuclear medicine procedure to investigate kidney function. The patient is positioned in front of a gamma camera, either seated or lying down, so we can get a posterior view of the kidneys. Then we inject a suitable radiopharmaceutical, which is a radioactive tracer uh, that is taken up by the kidneys, passes through the kidneys, is excreted in the urine and passes on into the bladder. So we acquire a dynamic study, typically one image every 20 seconds with the gamma camera for about 30 minutes. Then we analyse those images using the computer to produce curves of activity against time, showing how the activity passes through the kidneys. So the renogram curves that we get demonstrate kidney function, both uptake by the kidneys as well as elimination into the bladder. So here's an example of a renogram. Here we can see some images taken with the gamma camera uh, where early on we can see activity in the left kidney and as time progresses the activity in the left kidney uh, diminishes. Uh, the uh, right kidney however uh, shows uh, less activity early on and as time goes on the activity just increases. Uh, meanwhile the activity in the bladder is increasing all the time as we would expect. So if we draw a region of interest here shown in blue around the left kidney, we get this curve showing how the activity changes with time. It increases up to a maximum at about four minutes um, and then it falls again uh, showing emptying on into the bladder. So this curve for the left kidney early on shows a good rise showing it's got a good uptake and got normal emptying. However, when we draw a region of interest around the right kidney, here shown in red, we see that initially it rises less steeply than the, the left kidney, indicating that it's got less good function. And indeed the computer calculates that this right kidney only has 20% of the patient's total overall renal function. But we also see from the right kidney curve that it goes on up and up and up and doesn't empty at all. So clearly this right kidney has much worse emptying as well as having worse uptake. So the renogram can show that there's a, a problem with that right kidney uh, and we'd like to know more about that. So these renogram curves show how the radioactive tracer moves through the kidneys following an intravenous injection. And to quantify the renogram we want to determine two things. First of all, tracer uptake into each kidney, and secondly, tracer transit through the kidney. The problems that we have to deal with are, first of all, we've got to relate the curves to the administered activity, and we've got to subtract background activity. Then we realise that the curves are a rather complicated shape because they depend on blood input as well as transit through the kidney, and we want to separate these two effects in order to determine the transit time through the kidney. In a previous talk where I've talked about processing the renogram, I've explained how to relate the curves to administered activity and how to subtract background. So in this talk I want to say more about how we deal with the complicated shape in order to determine the transit time through the kidney. 
So if we have a look at where the radiopharmaceutical goes after we inject it, we inject into the blood. So we start off with all the activity in the blood. Um, but these radiopharmaceuticals that we use for inography uh, can also diffuse out into extravascular tissues, all of the tissues that lie outside the blood system. And that's a two-way process. They tend to diffuse back again as well. What we're interested in is uptake by the kidney. So we're interested in what passes from the blood into the kidney, passes through the kidney and is eliminated uh, in the urine and comes out into the bladder. But of course activity is also taken up by the other kidney, passes through that kidney and also comes out into the urine. Um, because it's in the blood it passes through to all of our organs in the body um, and if it passes through those uh, without being taken up it will also come back and recirculate around the blood uh, again. Uh, and indeed even activity that um, passes uh, into the renal artery into the kidney that we're interested in some comes out through the renal vein because not all of it is uh, taken up by the kidney and even that will then pass back in recirculation into the blood. So the blood shows a complicated activity time curve which starts high after injection but falls of, uh, in a complicated shape because of all of these processes. The activity time curve from the kidney will start from zero and will rise up to a maximum uh, but as it transits through uh, the kidney and comes out into the urine that curve will begin to fall again and the activity time curve from the urine uh, shows a delay before it rises again. So we're interested in analysing all these curves and you can see why the curves are indeed a complicated shape depending on all of these factors. So we're interested in kidney transit time and we can see that a normal renogram like the one for the left kidney here peaks at about four minutes and then it empties. Um, but a renogram curve like the one from the right kidney that continually rises shows that that kidney doesn't empty normally. It's got a long transit time tracer through the kidney. But uh, what we really would like to know is, is this obstructed so this is not coming out of the kidney uh, at all due to some blockage? Or is it just a large volume renal pelvis where it takes a long time simply because there's a large volume for it to pass through? And the time to peak, uh, which we can use very simply from the curves, um, is a rather crude measure of transit time. So we want something better. And it would be nice to determine the transit time properly. So deconvolution, which I'm talking about in this talk, is a mathematical technique for doing just that. So that's the end of the first part of this talk. In the second part, I'll explain the theory behind deconvolution.